Uh, well, today, first talk is going to be by Joe Minahan from Uppsala University, and he's going to be talking about maximal super young males on spheres. Okay, well, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here uh, in this really pleasant area. Um, so the work I want to discuss is uh, based on a couple of papers, uh, one from 2015 and then another uh, with, uh, at the time, two graduate students, one from Uppsala, one from MIT. And then uh, the latter part of the talk, I'll talk about uh, work in progress uh, with uh, uh, Nikolai Babeff, uh, Peter Bowmans, Friedrich Godesson, Anton Nadell, and... Um, okay. Um, so, uh, um, so what, what I'm going to talk about today are supersymmetric gauge theories on Euclidean spheres, and uh, they can exist, and so the, we might ask, uh, why do they exist? And the short answer, basically, is that there exists a corresponding supergroup, okay? So, for example, in n equals 4, uh, in 4D, uh, okay, this is well known, the supergroup for this is SU4 slash 4. If it's n equals 2, then it's OSP2 slash 4. If it's n equals 1 in 5D, there's an SU4 slash 1. If it's an n equals 1 SCFD in 5D, okay, then it's SO2 comma 5. It, it's F4, okay, which uh, has a bosonic subgroup of SO2 comma 5 cross SU2. And if it's n equals 2 in 5D, then it can be, it's an SU4 1 comma 1. Okay, and I'm writing this where I'm assuming a non-compact R symmetry group, and I'll explain a little later why I'm assuming it's non-compact. Um, uh, but it's also possible to have n equals 2 on a 6-sphere, and so the corresponding supergroup in that case is an, is a, is an S4, which has, you can think of as having an SO7 subgroup, a bosonic subgroup corresponding to the isometries of the 6-sphere, and an SU1 comma 1 um, uh, for the R symmetry in that case. And there's, you can also have an N equals 1 on S7, which is, uh, and the group is OSP H slash 2 over the reals. Um, but there are a couple cases you can have, even though you can have these in flat space. For example, you can't have super Yang mills on, on a six sphere with n equals 1 supersymmetry, even though such a thing exists on flat space, uh, because there's no available group that would have the right properties. And likewise, you can't have n equals 1, say, on a, sp on a sphere with dimensions greater than 7 uh, for the exact same reason. Okay. Um, this doesn't work too well. Uh, so today, what I'm going to consider are maximally supersymmetric gang mills, okay? And so these will be theories with 16 supersymmetries. So for example, n equals 8 and 3D, n equals 4 and 4D, n equals 2 and 5D and 6D, and n equals 1 and 7D. Um, but as we, I'll also consider the case where the dimension of my sphere, sphere is a non-integer dimension. Okay, and we're going to actually use this basically to do an analytic continuations to find uh, sort of properties of these theories um, uh, today. So, we, in all these cases, we, we can localize these theories. So, for example, Pestoon, of course, in his famous paper from 20, 2007, considered n equals 4, hi, mom, n, n, n equals 2 super Yang mills in 4D, um, or we can have n equals 2 and higher super Yang mills on, or with Chern Simons in 3D. We could have n equals 1 or 2 super Yang mills in 5D. We can have 2 comma 2 in 2D. And we can have n equals 260 and n equals 170 in super Yang mills. All of these can be localized, okay? And so you can extract things like free energies and Wilson uh, super expectation values for supersymmetric Wilson loops. Um, and it's possible also to consider to localize these theories to non-integer values of the dimensions. So I'm not actually going to, uh, I'll actually sort of present what the results are, but I won't go into too many details about, I won't go into any detail about how to get this. I'll just say what the result is at the end. Um, 
So then we can ask a few questions if we're able to do this localization. Uh, so for one question we could ask is how does the behavior of the free energy and the expectation values of the Wilson loops change with the different dimensions uh, for our maximally supersymmetric Yang mills? So another question we can ask, ask is, since uh, these theories are not going to be conformal, except in the case of d equals 4, um, you might ask, can we compare the localization results for these uh, gauge theories uh, to results in supergravity? So a famous successful example was the 4D case for n equals 2 star, so work done by Jorge Costia. Uh, uh, and also one paper with Alex Bushel. Okay, they, they computed these uh, various things for 40 n equals 2 star. And then Baba, Felvang, Friedman, and Pufu um, showed that they could precisely reproduce their results using this Pilch-Warner solution uh, in supergravity. Um, so, uh, so today, um, what I'm going to give, what I'm going to talk about, first I'll sort of review, uh, give a sort of shortish review of a generalized version of Preston's construction and how to, and its perturbative localization for the maximally supersymmetric case. Uh, then we will consider free energies for these, uh, for the maximally supersymmetric Yang mills in different dimensions. Uh, we will consider B BPS Wilson loops, okay, in different direct uh, dimensions. And to sort of extract the results for D equals 3, 6, and 7 will we'll require analytic continuation in the dimension. And then uh, at the end, I'm going to compare it to uh, supergravity results, results sourced by what are known as spherical E brains. So these are going to be Euclidean brains. And we'll basically focus on the S7 case. Uh, we, we have results for other as well, but it turns out the S7 has a very simple uh, supergravity solution, so I'm just going to mainly focus on this case here. And then I'll give some concluding remarks. Okay, so, um, so here is a quick sort of review of how we can uh, consider these theories and localize these theories. So the starting point is 10-dimensional uh, flat space super Yang mills. Okay, and so the flat space Lagrangian can be written down very simply. It was done by Brink, Shirk, and Schwartz a long, long time ago. And it just contains a trace of an F squared and a kinetic term for, uh, for, a, for a vial fermion in 10, Meyer-Varner vial fermion in 10 dimensions. This action is invariant under the supersymmetry transformations. Um, so, uh, so the gauge fields transform this way, where uh, the psi with an index up, okay, these size are real, okay, and the, the gammas, the gamma matrices are real and symmetric, okay, and um, the, uh, likewise, the transformations on the size are related to the field strengths in this way. Um, the, the epsilon alphas, I'm assuming, are, are bosonic, okay, and they're real chiral spinners, okay, and there's six in, 16 independent uh, uh, of these epsilons, so there's 16 independent supersymmetry transformations you can make. Okay, then what you can do is you can dimensionally reduce to a d-dimensional Euclidean gauge theory. And the way we'll do this, we'll exactly be following what Peston did in the 4D case. So we will assume that uh, we, will take, we, will, uh, we will call the indices uh, along the, um, the non-reduced the non dimensions. We'll call those mu's, okay, and they run from 1 to d. Okay, so these are all along spatial directions, so this is going to be Euclidean. And then the scalar fields will be the other components, okay, and we'll use like I, capital I and capital J for, to denote those terms. Okay, and they run from uh, zero, so it, it includes the time-like direction, and also the rest of the dimensions up to nine here, the rest of the spatial directions. Okay, so in the reduced case then, the, uh, we assume that there's no dependence in the reduced directions, uh, no, you know, no, uh, in the fields. So the gauge fields then become just covariant derivatives. It, when we have a, when we have crossed indices like this, the, the field strength becomes a covariant derivative acting on the scalar. And then the case where we have two internal indices, uh, it just becomes a commutator of two scalar fields transforming, and the scalar fields, you know, transforming the adjoint representation. 
Now, the scalars also transform under a vector representation of an SO1 9 minus D R symmetry. Okay, so it's non compact because we've chosen one of the directions to be along this time direction here. And it also means that the phi naught term is going to have the wrong sign kinetic term. Okay, but at the end of the day, you're going to do a you'll end up doing a wick rotation and sort of getting to the right thing and everything works out. Finally, the d-dimensional coupling is related to the 10-dimensional coupling just divided by a volume factor in this way. Um, so now we want to put the theory on a sphere. Okay, and so in the 4D case, which is super conformal, okay, when we put, uh, when we put, when we go from flat space to the sphere, okay, there's a, there's a conformal map we can do, okay, and that it basically induces a conformal mass term for the scalars, okay, if D is not equal to 4, it's not super conformal, but we will assume that we have a similar sort, uh, sort of term as this for the scalar fields, okay, where uh, I've sort of normalized things to be uh, this way, uh, so we have a coefficient delta i, uh, and the, even though I have three indices here, I'm still summing over all the i's. And the delta i's are not necessarily the same for each value of i. Okay. Now, in the 4D case, the delta i would be equal to 1, okay? and so this is sort of like the analog of the dimension for phi i, okay? which determines, you know, the dimension sort of deter determines this coefficient here. Okay, but in addition to this term, okay, we're going to need further terms to preserve supersymmetry if D is not equal to 4. Okay, so now on the sphere, there are no covariantly constant spinners. Okay, however, there are conformal killing spinners. And so the killing spinners satisfy this well-known equation that if we take a covariant derivative uh, on this bosonic spinner, Okay, we get back another spinner of the opposite chirality. That's what this tilde on top of it means, multiplied by a gamma matrix. Okay, and so, um, and so it is basically you get a term like this. And then if we then act with the covariant derivative on the epsilon tilde, we get back the original spinner epsilon, okay, with a gamma matrix multiplied by a factor of 1 over 4 r squared and a minus sign. So anyways, there's 32 independent solutions for this, okay? Uh, but in, except for D equals 4, we're only going to have 16 supersymmetries. So we want to reduce the number of symmetries, supersymmetries, okay? So we want to re reduce the number of independent uh, epsilon. So what we can do is we can basically say that epsilon tilde is related to epsilon by beta times a combination of gamma matrices lambda, okay? where beta is defined to be 1 over 2r. And for this to be consistent with this equation up here, you have to, you have to insist that, that this lambda anti-commutes with the gamma matrices, okay, and that it squares to 1. And if d is not equal to 4, okay, we also have to assume that it's anti-symmetric. Okay, so the simplest thing you can choose for this lambda, then, is a product of three gamma matrices, okay, so gamma 8, 9, and 0. Okay, and so then it's, this then will anti-commute with the gamma mu's as long as mu is not equal to 8, 9, or 0. So you can see then that this construction will work up to sphe for spheres up to d equals 7. Okay. Uh, we, can't, we can't go above 7 because that would require, say, having a mu be an 8, and then it does an anti-commute with this guy here. Okay, so then on the sphere, we also have to modify the supersymmetry transformation. So the original transformations in flat space uh, were this part, was this part inside here. Okay, so on the sphere, the transformation for the, gate, for the A's is the same. Okay, but for the size, we have to add an extra term, okay, which is, comes with this covariant derivative acting on the epsilon uh, multiplied by a scalar term and a gamma matrix and a coefficient alpha i. And it turns out that these alphas are going to be not are going to be different depending on whether the index is in the eight, nine, or zero, or any of the other directions here. So we'll we'll differentiate those types of indices by using a capital A, say, for eight, nine, and zero, and a small i, okay, for the other uh, scalar dimension directions, okay. And so it turns out then we have to choose them to be of this form. Okay, or this form, and you can see, except for d equals 4, they're not going to be equal. 
so they're going to be different. And also, these coefficients delta that appeared in the math terms, okay, are going to be related to, uh, uh, are going to have this form here. So for the A's, it's equal to the alphas. And for the I's, okay, I'm just going to write it like this. Okay, so then you can do a little work and then show that the complete maximally su supersymmetric Lagrangian, okay, will have this form. Okay, so, uh, so if D equals 4, uh, this term here is not here, this term here is not here. And you can also see that this ter the coefficient on this term is equal to the coefficient on this term. Okay, but if D, D is not equal to 4, we have these extra terms. And you can see that actually this is going to break the R symmetry from the original flat space R symmetry uh, to something smaller. Okay, f so f if D is not equal to 4, this coefficient is different than this coefficient. So any sort of R symmetry transformations that rotates the, f the, the phi little i's into a phi big A Okay, it's not going to be invariant. Okay. Uh, likewise, this term here is not invariant under the transformation, and this term here is not going to be invariant because it just involves the eight, 0, 8, and 9. Okay, so, so the R symmetry is broken except for D equals 4, but also for D equals 7 it's not broken because if D is equal to 7, there's no five little I's. Okay, so the R symmetry is still preserved. Okay, so the isometry is basically broken for to SO, from SO1 9 minus D to an SO1 comma 2 across an SO7 minus D. Other questions so far on this? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> um. Okay, and um, if if D is less than or equal to 5, then we can also reduce the 8 supersymmetries because we can, we can choose our epsilons to also satisfy a, an additional condition. Uh, namely, we can take uh, four gamma matrices and multiply them together, and this gamma 6, 7, 8, 9 squares to 1, so we can have eigenvalues of this thing to be plus or minus 1. Uh, so we'll assume that the epsilons then can be, uh, are, have positive eigenvalues on this. And then the, f the fermion fields split into uh, a little psi and a chi, where the psi has a plus, is, has one chirality under this 7, 8, 9, and the chi has the opposite chirality. And then the original terms in my, Lagrange, in, in my theory sort of split up into a vector multiplet and a hypermultiplet, where the vector multiplet has the gauge fields, the size, and some of the phi fields, namely the zero, and then everything up to five. And then the hypermultiplet would have a chi, and the rest of the, the scalar fields, which have indices six to nine. And since I only have eight supersymmetries in this case, it's less restrictive, okay? So I can modify my coefficients by adding a, by including a hypermultiplet, hypermultiplet mass term, okay? And so they, these things get modified in this way, uh, so, just, just the main thing to note is that, okay, there's some mass dependence now in these coefficients, uh, but don't worry too much about it. And also, this uh, mass term for the trace uh, psi lambda psi term splits up into terms with the lambdas and the chi's. So the, the chi's have the mass, they're, since they're in the hypermultiplet, so you get a mass term for this thing. This term stays the same, which had the vector multiplet. And also, the cubic term is also modified as well. But let me not write that down. Um, okay, so this this story is well known. It's been dis it's also been discussed in a few talks already. So I'll make this very brief. So now we want to localize. So we take a partition function. Uh, we add a uh, a term q v with a coefficient t to the action. Okay, so this q v uh, is q exact, and so it's independent of the value of t. Okay, so we can basically take t to, be to infinity so that the fields localize onto fixed loci of this v under this q. Okay, so basically then our partition function will become a sum over the various fixed loci, and then we have an integral over the, f over, uh, the, the fixed point locus, which I'll call the phi zeros, capital phi zeros, uh, with the, ve the action evaluated at the fixed point locus, and then a determinant factor uh, coming from the fluctuations about that fixed point locus. So anyways, uh, for Q, basically just do exactly the same thing uh, that Eston does. Okay, we have a term that uh, basically involves the psi fields. 
And the bosonic part of this looks like this. Okay, um, so let me just uh, cut to the chase. So we're only going to be worrying about the large end limit. So we're not going to only we're only going to worry about perturbative contributions. Uh, so we only worry about basically what I call the zero instanton sector, where basically the gauge fields are turned off, so they're zero. And if you go to the fixed point locus and then substitute it back into the uh, into the Lagrangian you find that it's, the Lagrangian is given by this expression here, so it depends on the scalar fields phi zero, but the sca scalar these, these, these are constant on the sphere, so basically we just have to integrate over constant values of phi naught. Okay, and then there's a prefactor here, and you can see that, for example, that if d is equal to three, this term is gone, okay, and that sort of consistent with your intuition that the, uh, that the, uh, super Yang, the, the Yang Mills action in three dimensions is Q exact, okay, so it shouldn't contribute to the partition function, so it shouldn't be, be making any contrib contribution to the partition function or to the action, so you can see that that's the case. Um, and uh, we'll find it convenient to sort of re-express this in a slightly different way, so to get the action, we just integrate over the volume of the sphere, okay, so we get uh, at a factor of SD, times a factor of r to the d minus 4, uh, because we had to start with this 1 over r squared, and we chose, and we went to a dimensionless variable sigma, okay, here, uh, so instead of the phi 0, okay, so the action looks like this. Um, and uh, I should also say that I've also, this is positive, so I've, I've wick rotated, basically, uh, my my scalar field phi naught here in this expression here. Okay, so this doesn't change uh, when breaking to eight supersymmetries since the only thing that contributes to the, to the action basically is the phi naught field, and the phi naught field is still part of the vector multiple in AD for eight supersymmetries. Okay, so then we have a question of determinant factors. And um, so we want to be able to basically generalize this to any value of d. And um, so uh, we were only able to do this for any value of d by breaking things up into eight supersymmetries and looking at vector multiplets and hypermultiplets. I'm sure there's a way to do it straightforwardly from 16 supersymmetries, but we never figured out how to do it. Um, so, uh, so anyways, then, uh, so as usual, uh, when you get a partition function, you have vast cancellations between bosonic contributions and fermionic contributions in the determinant factors, okay, but there's a little bit left over. And a nice way to do this calculation is to do index theorems, uh, okay, but we, again, we want to do this for general values of D, including ne necessarily integer values. And in that case, we don't necessarily have index theorems. So in the, in the end, we ended up doing a more brute force way of, well, maybe they're index theorems, but I don't know how to do index theorems uh, if D is not, say, an integer. In the end, we sort of did a more brute force way of just computing the contributions from the bosons and the contributions from the fermions and canceled things off. And at the end of the day, what you find is a product over the gamma here are basically the roots uh, of, uh, uh, are the roots in the, in the gauge group uh, tens, uh, dotted, uh, you know, contracted with the, the scalar fields phi zero. Uh, you, get a pro you get an infinite product from F1 to infinity, and you get a coefficient, you get a, a factor here um, which uh, uh, depends on the dimension and the value of n, and you can write in terms of the gamma functions like this. Okay, and so this you can clearly continue to di different values. And also you get another term that looks like this. Likewise, for a hypermultiplet, okay, again, uh, we did it sort of the brute force way of finding the contributions from bosons and the contributions from fermions and basically canceling terms off and seeing what we get. Uh, and you get an expression that looks like this, where mu here is the mass times uh, the radius, so this is dimensionless. Okay, so that can shift this term like this. Okay, now uh, we want to be able, to, we want to go to the maximally supersymmetric case, so that means su 16 supersymmetries. And to do that, basically, then you have to set the hypermultiplet mass to be an imaginary value times d minus 4 over 2. 
okay? And that will actually enhance the supersymmetry to 16 supersymmetries. And then we can combine these two terms together and with a little massaging, basically, uh, in, and also including a van der Maan factor, we can write this expression in a much simpler way uh, like this. Okay, so this is basically the final, uh, final uh, result, basically, for the determinant factors for general values of d. Okay, now, I told you before that we, to, to have eight supersymmetries, the dimension has to be less than five. Okay, so, so if we're doing vector multiplet and hypermultiplet, we had to start with d less than 5. Okay, but we can just analytically continue this result up to 6 and 7. Okay, and that, then that matches the results we had doing index theorems with Maxine. Okay, so, uh, so anyways, this is, our, this is our result for the determinant factors. And so combining it with the action then, Uh, well, the gauge, uh, the gauge fields are set to zero, so we're in the zero instanton sector. So, so, but it, 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 when we localized, okay, we did, you know, the usual thing of doing, uh, uh, you know, Fedayev pop, we had Fedayev pop off terms and things like that. Sorry, what? For example, vector multiple to the contribution from vector field, right? And uh, yeah. do, do you think, don't you You mean this phi zero term here? A phi uh, so th this is a scalar in the vector multiple. Okay, but uh, also gauge field contribute to the this bispecular harmonics in, in this. Oh, well, they, they, they contribute, yeah, no, no, the, yeah, certainly the fluctuations in, in yeah, they contributed. But we, but uh, in the end, okay, they basically it's independent of the gauge. We fixed the gauge and did the calculation, but in the end, it will be independent of the gauge. Yeah, no. When you compute these fluctuate, you had to look at fluctuations over all the fields about the fixed point locus. So, and uh, it's a big mess, uh, but uh, you can you can basically the way we did it is so uh, we took a, we generalized Kim and Kim's construction. So they did it in the d equal five case, okay. And it turns out we could we could sort of do this for to to an, do it for various different values for d for what they did. So oops, okay. So um, so anyways, then our perturbative partition function then, okay. So this is a contribution from the action here. So this was the term I wrote down before at the fixed point locus. Uh, and this is the determinant factors uh, from the previous slide. And so we want to uh, solve this. And so we, we're going to take the large n limit so we can solve by saddle point. And so from the action part, okay, we're going to get a term that's linear in these sigmas. And from this determinant factor, we're basically going to get some kernel over sigma i minus j. The C1 here is some coefficient that depends on the dimensions. And this G turns out then has, you can write down in this form right here. Okay, so perhaps this isn't very, uh, very intuitive what that is. So if I were to plot the G, okay, for various values of uh, D, okay, so for D equals four, that's the blue line here. Okay, G is basically just two over sigma, okay. Uh, and for D equals five or other values, okay, you have different sort of behavior. So for, for what I'll call the weak coupling behavior, where the sigma ij's are very small, okay, you can see they all sort of converge to the same behavior up here or down here, okay, and in this case then this, 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 this g factor is 2 over the difference in the eigenvalues. Okay, but for large separations, okay, having the d, d will change the behavior, okay, so if d is equal to 4, it's still 2 over sigma, so this is actually the exact for, for d. Okay, uh, but in general, what you get is that uh, this this behaves like uh, sigma ij to the d minus five, and I put in a sine factor like this with some coefficient c two. Okay, and c two has the dimension, it has a couple, it has these sorts of properties. So in the d equals five case, basically, you can see it goes out to a constant. So it's like having. So you can think of this as having a, th this this. Uh, this G16, this kernel factor, you can think of as being like the force between the eigenvalues. So 
So you can see that the force is linear pushing out when d equals 5. Um, if d is above 5, it actually gets bigger. The force gets bigger the further away you go. And basically what's going to happen is you get closer and closer to 6, this thing is going to basically turn higher and higher to being basically a linear function, but it's also going to turn up way up here. And then actually d equals 7, so when you cross over d equals 6, what happens is it's basically repulsive in this area, okay, but then it changes sign uh, in this area, so then it becomes attractive if it's actually far enough away. Uh, well, so what would happen then basically is the eigenvalues are going to sort of hang out around here. So, so they push out at short distances, but they can't get too far away because then they'll, they'll be pulled back in. So, so basically what's going to happen is that, uh, is that you're going to have half of them around here and half of them around here. <laughs> so. Um, but uh, Van der Waals, I think it's because uh, this this is too for, this is too re too attractive. Van der Waals, I think, isn't won't be uh, that attractive at large distances. I don't think. Uh, right, but the thing is, is that. Since this is getting bigger, since the ones the ones far away, they're going to pull them all back in. So if I had two, that's right. <laughs> in any case, uh, we're going to actually try and extract some behavior, actually not by actually doing this directly, but by we're basically going to solve an equation and basically analytically continue it. Okay, so. Uh, we're basically going to be interested in strong coupling because we want to make com comparisons to supergravity. Okay, so if lambda is much bigger than one, okay, then um, okay, so then this one over lambda, which is the term that appears here, this is basically this coming from the central potential of the eigenvalues. Okay, it's very weak. Okay, so you expect then to have large separations between your eigenvalues. Okay, so we should be in the large in the strong coupling regime for this, uh, for this kernel. And so, um, so, uh, so our, our we can write then the, the saddle point equation as an integral equation. And we're going to use then this approximation for G16 here for strong, for strong coupling uh, in this way like this. OK, so, um, so just you can make a back of the envelope sort of calculation to see how things will scale with lambda in this case. Uh, so, so lambda appears here, and so you can see then to solve this equation, okay, you, you would expect that sigma will scale as lambda to the 1 over 6 minus d, okay, and so the free energy should scale as lambda to the d minus 4 over 6 minus d to the n squared. Okay, so for example, so for d equals 5, the free energy will scale as lambda times n squared, okay, and this is how you get this, this n cubed behavior because lambda is the Thrift polynomial, so it can also has a factor of n in it. It's g angular squared times n uh, divided by uh, the radius in this case. Okay, so this, here you get this cubic behavior. It sits in there. So actually then, if we assume that n is much bigger than 1, we can actually solve, we can actually solve this equation. And it turns out the solution is actually quite simple. Uh, so this density uh, is basically b squared minus sigma squared to some power that depends on d multiplied by a coefficient if it's between two endpoints minus b and d, uh, uh, the coefficient is given here, and it's zero if sigma is outside of this. Okay, and this this endpoint b can be determined, and it's related to the uh, dimensions in this way. It's, this is really valid for d less than six, even. <laughs> be okay, because if d is if d is equal to you're going to see that actually this thing is negative. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, and, but I'm assuming that this integral here is going from minus b to b. 
Okay, but we're going to pull off the seven. We're going to pull off the seven D behavior differently. In the end, basically, there's going to be a scheme-dependent part in seven D and a scheme-independent part. And the scheme-dependent part is some is some is some co infinite constant, but we get rid of it, and we're going to have a scheme-independent independent part. Okay, so for examples, uh, so d equals four. Okay, so there you have the well, the, the famous Wigner distribution because you just have a Gaussian matrix model in that case. D equals five is that it, you have a constant density. Okay, uh, and d is equal to lambda over eight pi squared. Okay, d equals six. Okay, if we go back to over here, uh, you can see that this is going to blow up. That d is going to go to infinity because of uh, what term here? Oh, okay, gamma 5 minus d. Okay, so that, that's blowing up, and also the, the exponent is blowing up. So d, b is shooting out to infinity, um, and uh, so it's singular. Come on. Okay, and interestingly, uh, okay, so then as I was saying before, for d equals 7, you see that B is actually uh, negative, and not only that, it falls off with lambda. So it's like it's being pushed to the boundary. But actually, the way to think about this is that this is like a correction to uh, this other part that's further out. And, uh, and it has this delta function sort of support, as I was saying before. Um, uh, that, well, I don't, uh, no, I mean, I think everything, um, I'm pretty sure there's no two-cut solution, but that's not a great answer for you. <laughs> um, in the end, in the end, let me just, uh, let me, let me just assume this, okay, and then I'll com compare it to supergravity, supergravity calculation. And um, also for d equals three, okay, you, there's also a, uh, a finite distribution. And um, this is kind of interesting because I told you before that, uh, that uh, the action, the super Yang Mills action is Q exact in three dimensions. So the, basically the coefficient in front of, it, on the left-hand side of this integral equation is going to zero, but also the coefficient on the right-hand side is going to zero. Okay, and so basically things uh, sort of balance each other out. And so you get a finite distribution for eigenvalues in this case. Um, okay, two dimensions I wasn't going to talk about, but... Uh, Two dimensions, you can certainly uh, compute it. Now, the thing is, is that um, uh, that um, so so if you look in, so I gave you a list of uh, there was a case of the two comma two case for super Yang Mills in two D. So with two comma two, that particular super Yang Mills action was Q exact. Okay, in our case, it's not Q exact. And the reason is, is because there's actually, once you put it on the sphere, there's more than one way to make a supersymmetric Lagrangian. That when you take the flat space limit, becomes the ordinary super Yang Mills in 2D. So for example, if you look at, um, if you look at the action in 2D in, this, in, this, in the Q exact case, there's a term in the action that's an F12 term. Okay, so that's, so that's invariant, that's, that's fine in 2D. Okay, but you can't analytically continue. It's not, it's not invariant under that. So, but, um, so, uh, but we we can we can compute it, uh, um, and so what happens is it's, it's basically so, in two D, so the the in three D, um, oh shoot, I skipped ahead here. So in 3D, okay, this has a one-third behavior here. Um, has a one-third behavior. In 2D, it's going to be a one-fourth behavior. So it's going to have, so it's going to flatten, it's going to flatten out more. So it looks like this, and then it, 
like that. Um, I, I don't, well, maybe there is, but I don't see any. Um, I don't, I, I don't know. Okay, so anyways, then, uh, so now we have our eigenvalue distribution. We can plug it back into the action and the determinant factors, and we can, we can read off the free energy. Okay, and so uh, the free energy would have this behavior. Um, so, uh, uh, so it depends uh, on, on this. Uh, and um, uh, so with various di di values of the dimension, okay, this isn't that enlightening, but if we look at the examples, then um, you can see that for d equals 4, okay, we don't quite set it equal to 4 because we have this 1 over d minus 4 term here. Okay, so uh, we'll go to 4 minus epsilon, okay, and then there's also an epsilon factor that's going to show up in here, okay, and this again gives you the well-known minus n squared over 2 log lambda plus some uh, unimportant constant term. Uh, d equals 5. Okay, as a, you're going to end up with the, uh, a factor of lambda times n squared. So as, before, as I was saying before, this gives you this n cubed behavior for the free energy. Okay, d equals 6, okay, is divergent. Okay, so if I let, uh, if I let d equals 6 minus epsilon, okay, I have, a one, I have an epsilon here, but then I have 1 over epsilon to the 2 over epsilon. Okay, and that, so this is clearly going to minus infinity. So let me come back to this one. I'll look at this one later. And then d equals 7, okay, the free energy then uh, behaves like this. So these factors of 2 pi to the 10th n squared, and it falls off as lambda. So as I was saying before, this is sort of like the scheme independent part. There's sort of a constant part as well, okay, but this is, this is the part that we're interested in. And d goes to 3, the free energy goes to 0, as I was saying before, you should expect uh, since it's Q exact. Um, all right, so, uh, so if we go back to the saddle, point, so now let's go back and consider this 6 minus epsilon case. So if we go back to the saddle point equation, we actually, ex we set d equals 6 minus epsilon. Okay, the equation will look like this. Okay, so there's actually a sigma i minus sigma j summed over all these sigmas with a 1 over epsilon factor in front and then an epsilon times a log factor term here. So I can actually take this first term, I can do this sum, okay, and this is 6 over epsilon times n over sigma i, and then I have a finite term here with no epsilon dependence. And if you look at this term here, you can see it's the exact same form as this term over here. Okay, so what we can do is we can sort of redefine, we can sort of absorb this into the coupling. So I can define a bare coupling and a renormalized coupling. And the relation be between the two is just given uh, this way here. You can see that this will match this like that. So then in terms of this renormalized coupling, okay, then the free energy uh, looks like uh, this. You, you can write like this, okay, and so I have a 1 minus a factor times an epsilon to the 2 over epsilon, so you can write that as in the limit that epsilon goes to 0. You can write that as an exponent, okay, and you get an expression that looks like this. Now, um, in 60, 60 super Yang Mills, okay, is not, is not a renormalizable theory. So it's thought, so the UV, it should have a UV completion, and the UV completion is believed to be 1 comma 1 little string theory. Uh, so is there anything about this that looks little stringish? Um, well, okay, so this is very speculative on my part. Uh, but if you look at it, Okay, the little string tension uh, is related to the Yang-Mills coupling as uh, some factor divided by G Yang-Mills squared. So G Yang-Mills squared has units of length squared. Okay, so this is units of attention. So in this case then, F6 term looks like an exponent of some constant times T times the radius squared of the F6. 
So it looks a little bit like a contribution you would get from some, some world seed instanton. Okay, so you get the factor of the tension times the area of the, of the, of the, of the of say, the, the sphere, or whatever it is, the world sheet, uh, times some constant. So it's suggestive, but I don't really have much more to say about it. Okay, so, uh, how am I doing? 15 minutes, okay. Okay, so then we can go look at Wilson loops. Okay, so we can actually plug things into here. Uh, and, uh, and it turns out that using our values for our rho sigma, okay, we can actually write the Wilson loop basically in terms of uh, a modified Bessel function and, and in terms of these b's. So d equals 4, we get the famous result from, uh, from Costia and his collaborators from 2000. Uh, d equals 5, okay, we get a cinch function times 1 over lambda. D equals 7, okay, we get a cosh function over lambda and I'm going to approximate this as an exponent of 8 pi fourth over lambda, even though lambda is supposed to be large, okay, and so 1 over lambda is small, so you're not really in the exponential regime, but nonetheless, I'm going to do this approximation for later, okay. And d equals 3, actually, you end up with a non-trivial result, okay. So even though uh, the, it's, it's q exact, okay, if you plug in, uh, this expression, you find that the Wilson loop has this sort of behavior, okay, which depends on this 3 pi squared lambda to the one-third. And d equals 6 is an exponent of an exponent, and I don't know what to make of that. So. Yep. Uh, yeah, so lambda lambda is dimensionless. So lambda is uh, so lambda is equal to g angle squared um, divided by uh, well r to the four minus d. Uh, you can you can interpret it as a small sphere, right? So, for example, uh, so uh, Anton in the 5D case, uh, he looked at what you and the, he basically generalized what you and Horeca did for 4D in, you know, look, you know taking uh, these limits in these strong key, in these limits like this. Uh, so. Okay, so, uh, all right, so that's, that's, so these are, these are my re results from localization. Uh, so let me just uh, say something about comparing this to supergravity. So anyways, uh, in uh, this, this spring, uh, Bob F. Bowmans and Gaudison, they found supergravity solutions which are sourced by spherical brains. Okay. Now we will concentrate on the S7 case. And so I want to just sort of give you some sort of uh, remarks about this and some motivation about how to about sort of salient features in this. Okay, so first of all, we, we have a Euclidean gauge theory. So we're going to want Euclidean brains. So these are called E-brains by Hull uh, in 98. And um, he showed how to construct these brains. So the way you do this is you, you start with, say, 2B theory, and you t-dualize the time direction. Okay, so that means that any DP brains which have extent along the time, and the DP brains have extent along the time direction, when you t-dualize, they become uh, brains with no leg along the time direction, okay, so they're, Eucl so they're Euclidean, they only span Euclidean directions, okay, and they only span, span spatial directions, okay, and so he called this theory 2A star, and it has a 1-9 signature, and the brains in this theory are these Euclidean brains. So, so all DP brains, they become, T, uh, they become EP brains in 2A star. And the e, these EP brains, they have imaginary tension. So a nice way to think about this is that, say, say you consider an E1 brain. So an E1 brain you can think of as like a space-like world line. And a space-like world line you get from having a tachyon. 
okay? And so this has a tachyonic mass. Now, the brains, these EP brains are BPS, and since they have imaginary tensions, it means they have to have imaginary charges, which means they have to source imaginary fluxes. Okay. And if we think about the strong coupling limit of 2A star, so the E1 brains, we should think of our Kaluza Klein like modes on the M theory circle. And since they're tachyonic, they have imaginary mass masses, we have to have a time like circle, okay, to get uh, Kaluza Klein modes with the, that have imaginary masses. Okay, and so that means that the, this theory has a 2, 9 signature. So he called this the M star theory. So Hulk called this the, two, the M star theory. Okay, now, uh, so Bob F. Uh, Bowmans and Gaudison argued that the supergravity dual for super Yang mills on S7 is actually an 11 di dimensional supergravity on S7 cross H2, 2. So it's basically the hyperplane with two time like directions modified by a Zn and with an imaginary flux F4 through the H2, 2 mod Zn. Okay, so there's two time like directions in all of this because this H2, 2 has two. Okay, it has an imaginary flux. As I said, E brains will source imaginary fluxes. And the metric then, uh, you can write like this. So it's ds squared. So the, this is the part coming from the H22. This is the part coming from the seven sphere. You can see that the radius of the seven sphere is twice as big as the radius for the, for the H22. And the H22 metric, uh, you can think of as a vibration uh, in this way uh, over this. And the omega direction, okay, you can see is actually time-like because there's a minus sign here and a plus sign here. So that corresponds to the time-like M, M star theory circle. The d omega 2 squared, okay, that, which is equal to this, okay, this has an SO1 comma 2 isometry. So this corresponds to the R symmetry in this theory. And you also, since it's coming from an H2 comma 2, locally there's an SO2 comma 3 isometry. Um, now, say, unlike the case of, say, ABJM, where you have uh, ADS4 cross S7 mod uh, ZK, uh, in that case, the ZK acts freely, okay, so it's not singular, okay, in this case, this is actually has a conical singularity at rho equals zero, if N is not equal to one. And then the relation between the str string coupling and the Yang-Mills coupling uh, is given by this expression here. And I have this factor of two in red because there's always, um, <laughs> there's always a, a, a confusion about what, unit, what sort of conventions people are using. So Polchinski uses it without the two because Polchinski writes the metric, writes the Yang-Mills action with a one over four G squared times trace F squared. Well, uh, we're using one over two G squared. So this two is to use the one over two in that case. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, okay, good. Uh, so this is, I can also think of, this came from the two-way star, uh, and that had the string, and that's the relation. I didn't actually change it, because, but yeah, so I should write it in terms of like Planck, L11, but uh, no, that's, that's true. I, I left it in this way, just not to have one more. <laughs> um, okay. So now let's uh, try to compute some things. So uh, we're just going to consider the S7 case. So the holographic dual for a BPS Wilson loop on S7, the S7 equator, would be an M2 brain with legs along the S7 equator and also along these internal directions on H2, 2. Uh, so omega, remember, is the M theory, the M star theory circle, and rho is the one that goes into the quote unquote bulk of H2, 2. Uh, and the brain is fixed along T and Psi, so those were the ones that correspond to T and Psi were the components for this uh, omega 2, which is the one we use for the, ice, uh, the R symmetry. Okay, and so, uh, so the expectation value for the Wilson loop should be proportional to the E to the I of the action of this M2 brain. Okay, uh, then Okay, here I used LS in this case, <laughs> but uh, you can make the substitution like this. Okay, so the integral, we're, we're doing this on, it, on part of H22, so this, this integral is divergent. 
okay, but we do the normal regularization, uh, so we cut it off at rho naught, and we pick off the constant term, you find that the action is minus eight pi squared, eight pi to the fourth over lambda, which matches what I said was going to be the, uh, the Wilson loop using localization for this phase. Um, okay, so then we can look at the free energy. So we start with a 11 dimensional bosonic action. Um, so we have R4, uh, the, the curvature on the H2 comma two, the curvature on the S7, and a plus one half absolute value of F squared. And I've defined this absolute value of F squared to be positive, which is equal to minus this. And this, the F, this F squared part here without the minus sign is negative because remember these, are ima these, have, these, are, these, have, ima these have imaginary fluxes. And so we solve for the equations of motion for this. Uh, we find the relation between uh, the curvatures uh, for R4 and R7 look like this. And F, in terms of the, in terms of the um, radius of the radius of these uh, L7 and L4, okay, F squared is equal to this. So if we substitute this back into the action, uh, we get something that looks like this. So we want to integrate over d11x over 3 to the l to the fourth. Okay, so this comes to a slight, this brings us to a slight puzzle. So actually s is real, okay? But since we have a 2 comma 9 signature, if we wick, wick rotate those two time-like directions, okay, we still end up with a real s, okay? And so our e to the is going to is going to, going to be a phase, okay? But we want something that's not going to be a phase. Uh, uh, so uh, so we want something else. Um, but actually, there was a paper from 2016 by Diagraph, Heidenreich, Jefferson, and Waffe, where they considered the case of negative brains. And in this case, they they wanted a theory that could where they could get, have um, brains that led to supergroups as gauge groups. Okay. And these led to, when they did this investigation, these led to space times with unusual signatures. Uh, basically, all the different signatures that Hull argued could exist, they, they had all these. And it included the two comma nine. Now, they actually wanted to compute, say, uh, uh, one loop corrections to the actions. And when doing that, they had to do. Uh, uh, they needed to do uh, a wick rotation, okay? But they argued that actually, um, in order to avoid the I epsilon poles for the 2-9 signature, they actually shouldn't actually rotate the two time dimensions, okay? They should rotate the nine spatial directions into time directions, okay? So now, if I do nine spatial rotations, that gives me nine factors of I, so now my action becomes, uh, my, so E to the I S becomes real in that case. So I will call this the anti-Euclidean action SAE, okay, and if I'm careful of my factors of I, uh, okay, I end up with an overall plus sign here, okay, and now this is, you should think of a, uh, I, okay, I have a minus sign because I have 11 time-like directions here, okay, but this is actually going to be real, and I do this calculation, okay, and I have a, I have a, I have a divergent factor coming from the H2 comma 2 volume factor, uh, I should also explain a few other terms here. Okay, I get a factor of 1 over n because actually I'm modding out by the m theory circle by a factor of n, so the radius, so the radius around the circle it should be divided by a factor of n, and uh, various other factors of pi come in here. Okay, and then using the ADS CFT dictionary, we can make the, con the, calc make the substitutions like this, and we get then that this action, this anti Euclidean action, is exactly what I got before. Uh, when I did the analytic continuation of the seven sphere. Okay, so uh, that brings me to the close, and I have a minute and a half left, so let me just make a few concluding remarks. Okay, so I didn't actually show it here, but we can also reproduce free energies and Wilson loops for other values of d in the supergravity. Okay, modulo some prefactors. So, for example, like the, uh, the Wilson loop in three dimensions, I said, had this factor of three to the one-third times pi to the two-thirds times lambda to the one-third. So we get that in supergravity, except we also get a factor of two to the three-fourths. Well, we can only do it numerically, and, but it looks like it's two to the three-fourths times that term, I said. 
also with a minus sign, uh, so we're not so sure about that. Uh, uh, and um, but we can do this; it's just not as clean a result. Uh, we can also investigate cases with eight supersymmetries, uh, and in this case, the behavior for the free energy with only a vector multiple, say in d dimensions, is very similar to 16 supersymmetries in d plus t. So, anyways, thank you very much. Other questions for Joe? Jorge. Uh, 